and to have people here you can get welcome some real again. Live feedback. Yeah, that's Good awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so great to have you all here with us and, and welcome online. I've already had some tomatoes thrown at me, so uh, <laughs> I guess it is safer online a little bit. But we are glad to be together today. I'm so grateful that uh, for those of you who've gathered, and I would just say this if you have a good experience here, share that experience with other people because we hope to grow as things are able to open up, and uh, we just trust that God is going to continue you as he has to be faithful and be at work in our midst. Well, we are in a series that uh, we call Seven Words. They're the seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. And I want to remind us just at the outset of our message today that the cross was the trajectory of Jesus' life. From the very beginning, for Jesus, it was about the cross. Now, the Gospels make this clear. Jesus' own statements make this clear as well. In fact, if you look at Luke chapter 9, specifically, Jesus says again and again and again that the cross is on the horizon, that his destiny is the cross. And so that's why underneath the pain and the suffering, underneath the horror of the cross, there is life and there is hope. In fact, these very words that Jesus spoke from the cross, though they're words that were spoken in anguish, are words of life and words of hope. And we've been journeying with them. And today we're going to take a look at the fourth word of Jesus from the cross. It comes from um, Mark chapter 15, verse 34. Let me read it for you. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Now, of all the words that Jesus spoke from the cross, this one seems to be the one that is filled with greatest despair. This is the word that that Jesus speaks, and he asks in this word, why? Why is this happening? Now, you and I, in our life story, we know that word well. Because you and I have been through experiences where we have asked, why? Why is this happening? And that's the reason that you and I need this word of Jesus from the cross. Because every one of us at some point in our life has asked that question, why? Every one of us at some point has said to God, where are you, God? That's a common human experience And Jesus speaks those words to us from the cross for a very specific reason. So I want to go to the cross with Jesus to see if we can find the life and the hope that Jesus promises in this word. Now, it may be surprising to you that this word from Jesus on the cross is actually a direct quote from Scripture. If you take a look at Psalm 22, Psalm 22 actually begins with these very same words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It goes on to say, why are you so far away in saving me? So far away from the cries of my anguish. This is Psalm 22. Now, as a Jewish boy, Jesus grew up with the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus grew up learning, knowing, memorizing the scriptures. And so there's no doubt in my mind and and almost all of the commentators, that what began with these words verbally from the cross continued in Jesus' heart. Jesus continued to recite in the depth of his heart the entire psalm, Psalm 22, because he knew it so well, but those words which began it are words we hear from the cross. So in his suffering, Jesus turns to the psalms. In his suffering, Jesus turns to God's word. And it's likely that these first words said out loud began for Jesus, his recitation of the entire psalm, Psalm 22. I'd like to encourage you at home today to read through Psalm 22 so you can read through what Jesus was thinking in the depths of his heart in that moment on the cross. I think you'll be profoundly struck and encouraged by what you read. That's where Jesus went when he was on the cross. But there's a deeper thing going on here too, and that's what I want to explore for just a couple minutes. It's a fulfillment of scripture. The gospel writers want us to see the connection between 
Jesus and the Old Testament. They want us to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. Matthew, the gospel writer Matthew, does this brilliantly through his whole gospel. There are constant touchstones. Jesus said this to fulfill this. Jesus did this to fulfill that. Matthew does it so brilliantly. But every gospel writer at the cross gives special attention to the connectedness between Jesus' suffering and death and the Old Testament scriptures. They want us to see that touchstone. So let me give you a brief overview of the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures we see when Jesus is on the cross. Last week we talked about the soldiers that were gathered at the foot of the cross. They were gambling for Jesus' clothing. Psalm twenty-two, eighteen says this, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Right after Jesus says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People come up to the cross and they hold up to Jesus a sponge with a mixture of wine and vinegar to try to offer him that mixture. Psalm 69, 21 says this, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. The gospels tell us that two criminals were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. Isaiah 53, 12 says this, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We're told that the soldiers and the religious leaders and even the crowds as they gathered at the cross mock Jesus. Psalm 22, 7 and 8 says this, All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. You see, the gospel writers want us to know the cross was not a random act of violence. The cross of Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures. It was the fulfillment of the mission of Jesus to give his life as a ransom for many. But the suffering that came with the cross was extraordinary. James Edwards, who is a a fantastic New Testament scholar, writes this about Jesus on the cross. But the suffering that came with it was extraordinary. Rejected and scorned by Israel, sacrificed as a political pawn by Rome, denied and abandoned by his own followers, Jesus is wholly forsaken and exposed to the horror of humanity's sin. Its horror is so total that in his dying breath, he senses his separation from God. The cross is not just about physical suffering. It is about this wrenching, this separation that Jesus experiences in the depths of his soul in his relationship with the Father. The cross is about, God, where are you? Where are you? Jesus experiences that level of suffering at the cross. I grew up in church. I was a church kid from the time I can remember. And so I went through all the church stuff that you grow up in right? And there came a time when I was in about sixth grade, and we had a confirmation class at our church. So that was an opportunity to learn a little bit more in depth about the Gospels, about Jesus, about the Christian life. I remember once our pastor came in to answer questions. That's always a dangerous thing. I hardly ever go into Sunday school classes and talk to kids because they ask the best questions. But I was the kid, and the pastor came in, and so I I raised my hand, and I said, okay, if Jesus was fully God, When he was hanging on the cross, did he really suffer? I mean, how can that be if Jesus is like all God? How can he suffer? That was a brilliant question. (laughs) Turns out I wasn't the first one to ask it. (laughs) Actually, it's a question that's been asked throughout the centuries. In fact, right from the very beginning of the Gospels, there has been this resistance to the suffering element of the cross. 
We don't like the fact that the cross points to a God who suffers. We're uncomfortable with that. Jewish people were extremely uncomfortable with that truth. They couldn't handle the fact that a Messiah would suffer. That was completely out of the category of reality for them. Gentile people resisted it too because of the influence of Gnosticism. Gnosticism and, and that influence suggested that Jesus only appeared to suffer, but that his true self, his true soul wasn't really present on the cross. He didn't really experience suffering. So right from the beginning, there was this resistance to the fact that God, if he was fully in Christ, could actually suffer. That's why when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he brought incredible clarity to this right from the beginning of his letter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes this, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, the power of God and the wisdom of God. We don't want a God who suffers. We don't want a suffering Jesus, but it's exactly what we need. We need to know, we need to understand in the depths of our heart that Jesus really suffered on the cross. So that when you cry out, where are you, God? You have a companion. You see, it's in his suffering that Jesus ransoms us. It's in his suffering that Jesus pays the debt for our sin. The horror of humanity's sin is placed on Jesus at the cross, and it is deep and significant, severe, and death-dealing. And we have to feel the weight of that suffering on Jesus, not so that we can wallow in guilt but so we can allow God's love to transform our lives. Not to wallow in guilt, but to allow God's love to transform us. Jesus' show, suffering shows us a God who can identify with us. He's been there. So that when you cry, why God? When you cry out, God, where are you? You have a companion. You know that God gets it. <laughs> Jesus' words from the cross, these words tell us God gets it. He gets it. For that reason, these are words of hope. For that reason, these are words of life. Even though they sound desperate, they're words of hope and they're words of life for us today. Tim Keller writes this, Jesus was getting the ultimate futility of our lives that our lives deserved so that we could be forgiven and we could be embraced by God. Jesus was experiencing that ultimate abandonment so that we could be the ones that are rescued and saved and redeemed. Two summers ago, uh, we went through a sermon series here at SRPC and uh, it was on the book of Ecclesiastes. And I want to remind you just of the opening words of the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. You're going to love this. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Now, with that introduction, you're probably not going to jump on Amazon this afternoon and buy the book, right? I mean, it's just you don't want to read a book like that. But that's the way Ecclesiastes starts. The writer is trying to help us see how empty life can be without God. The writer of Ecclesiastes is trying to help us understand that our suffering makes no sense apart from God. It is meaningless. Life is meaningless without God. And when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is there. He's in that meaningless place. He is in a life abandoned by God's presence. He feels that separation. Meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Jesus goes there in his suffering. So we don't have to when we suffer. That's why this is a word of hope. 
Think about it this way. Christianity is the only religion where God comes into the world and suffers. There's no other religion like that. Christianity is the only religion where God comes into the world and suffers. And God's response to suffering is not an explanation. God's response to suffering is a companion. It's Jesus. Think about it. <laughs> We've all gone through experiences where we're going through hard times, we're suffering, we're, we're in a difficult space. And you do not want, when you share that experience, when you have the courage to share that experience with a friend, with someone you, you know, you do not want an explanation. You don't want someone to say, you know, God must have a purpose for this. That is like, you don't want to hear that when you're suffering. When you share your suffering with a friend, you don't want to hear something like this. You know, God never gives us something too great to handle. He never gives us more than we can take. You don't want to hear that. When you suffer, when I suffer, we don't want an explanation. We want a companion. We want someone to walk with us in that suffering. I've been a pastor a long time, and I know this. I know there's a couple things that happen when people go through difficult times. The first thing that can happen is people can think this. You know, I'm being punished for, for something I did somewhere in the past or maybe recently. God is punishing me. That's what people can think when they go through suffering. The cross says Jesus took your punishment. It was his to bear. You aren't being punished because Jesus took it for you. Our closing song today in just a few minutes is a song called I Stand. And, and one of the verses is this. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders. My soul now to stand. When you're going through suffering, it's not that you're being punished. The cross says Jesus took your punishment. Your sin was his to bear. I also know this, that when people go through times of struggle and suffering, they also think, you know, God doesn't care. God must not care. The cross says God does. In fact, Jesus died to show you how much God cares. Jesus died and rose so he could companion with you in your suffering in your struggle. The cross says Jesus is with you in your suffering. Each week in our sermon, I, I like to throw some questions for reflection out. So whether you're, you're talking at home or in a group of people, you have an opportunity to just digest a few things and, and think more deeply about them. And I, I wanna share two of them with you today that comes out of this message. The first is this, what is your why Every single one of us, I'm sure, has had an experience where we say, why? Or we might be going through one right now. Or maybe we're entering into one or just coming out of one. What is your why? Why, God? Why? And do you have a, a sense of hope in the midst of it? The hope that we have in the midst of every why that we experience is Jesus. It's the cross. It's the fact that God gets it. That's our hope. The second question I'd like to ask you to think about is this. Is someone you know suffering? Is someone you know suffering right now? And if so, how will you companion with them? You see, what the Bible helps us understand is in the same way God has come alongside of us in Jesus Christ, we who live a life of faith in Jesus have the opportunity to come alongside of others in their suffering. The Apostle Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The God of all comfort 
allows us to move into situations with others who are suffering and offer that same comfort that we ourselves have received. You see, that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus, the one who died on the cross for us. We're called to companion with those who are suffering, wherever they are, whoever they are. Who do you know that's suffering right now? How will you companion with them this week? Well, last Monday was a marker day for us, globally, actually, in our world. If you remember March 11th, 2020, it was the year that the World Health Organization declared that the coronavirus was a global pandemic. And the images that began to accelerate every day on the news and every single outlet were just heart-wrenching and heartbreaking. It has been a year of loneliness. It's been a year of isolation. It's been a year of struggling for many to make ends meet. It's been a year of heartbreak and loss. Well over 500,000 people in our country alone, dead, gone, lost because of COVID-19. I remember the images on television, on the news that, that I've seen over this past year. Images and stories, images of hospitals in Italy overrun with people dying, breathing their last. Images of nursing homes in, in Washington where people are being wheeled out seemingly by the dozens on carts covered up because they're gone. I remember the images of mass graves in Brazil trenches dug to put people because there was no one, nowhere else to put them. I remember images of schools closing, clo closing, images of huge lines, people lining up just to get food. I remember images of, of brave essential workers going into harm's way so that they could serve people that need to. I remember images, and you do too, of healthcare workers stretched to the limit, overwhelmed, exhausted, sitting on curbsides with their heads in their hand and their mask on, weeping because of what they experienced during the day with no end in sight. There was, a, there was an EMT uh, person that was interviewed early on in that phase of the pandemic. And here's what he said. He said, I wake up every day and I go to work knowing that I'm going to do death all day long. I thought about those images. I saw some of those images last week, and I asked myself this question, why does that grab me so much? Why has that been so impactful? And here's why. Because we have suffered together. We've done this journey together, not just as people in California, not just as Americans, but people all the world over. We have suffered together. And today as we begin to emerge and Lord willing begin to take the first steps back, we can be sure of this, that Jesus Christ is here that Jesus Christ has journeyed with us in our suffering. And the words of Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, are words we can anchor deeply in today, knowing that because Jesus suffered that on the cross, he is with us in our suffering. Knowing that because Jesus rose from the grave, he companions with us as we rise and begin to move forward again. That's his promise. And it's a promise that's anchored at the cross. Would you pray with me? Jesus, in our world, we are no stranger to suffering. And in this past year, we've experienced it in so many ways. Some we can verbalize, and others we can't. We just know they're there, and they're deep inside, and it hurts. But Lord, we thank you that in Jesus Christ, we have a companion in our suffering. 
one who knows what it's like to experience that sense of separation. And because of Jesus, we know that you get it, God. You understand. And so I pray that whatever that place is right now that we are struggling with, wherever that place of suffering is for us right now, that we by faith in you, Lord Jesus, would be able to overcome any doubt that we are being punished or any thought that we're being punished or any doubt that you're with us, but that we would look to Jesus once again and understand your love and your presence and even more than that, your victory. Lord, thank you for this new day. Thank you for this new beginning. And we pray that as we continue to move forward, just a day at a time, that we would love you.